A new moon of excitement and rovers on the red planet. You're listening to Are We There Yet? The radio show exploring space exploration. Hi, I'm Brendan Byrne. It has been an eventful few weeks with moon missions, from the failure of commercial company Astrobotics Lander to NASA's delaying human missions to the moon. We'll speak with Rebecca Boyle, acclaimed journalist and author, about these missions and her new book, Our Moon, which explores humanity's fascination with our celestial neighbor. Then our robotic explorers on Mars are back to work after a brief but planned pause in communication. We'll speak with rover scientists and University of Florida astrobiologist Amy Williams about the latest from NASA's Perseverance rover as it searches for ancient signs of life on Mars. That's ahead on Are We There Yet? Recently, Astrobotics' Peregrine Moon Lander mission failed, and NASA delayed its upcoming Artemis missions to put humans back on the moon. But despite these delays and setbacks, interest in the moon is still high. Rebecca Boyle, acclaimed journalist and author, says the urge to get back to the moon is from curiosity and our own human connection to the moon. Her newest book, Our Moon, How Earth's Celestial Companion Transformed the Planet, Guided Evolution, and Made Us Who We Are, talks about her fascination with the moon and the way it has influenced humanity. She joins us now. Rebecca, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. The moon has been in the news recently, notably about our efforts to get there. Let's start first with the astrobotic lander that failed to reach the moon. And stepping back before launch, why was this mission so important? This was such a huge milestone because it was the first privately built and privately funded lander to try to attempt to go to the moon. I, I think still primarily is funded by NASA grants. So it's not like it's, you know, just investors, but it is also investors. NASA is just a customer of among many. And that's really a unique way of thinking about this. You know, the, the attempts to go to the moon have always been government led here in other countries. This was the first time it was going to be a private enterprise trying to do it. Let's talk about what we know happened to this mission. Why did it not make it there? They seem to have had a fuel issue, which is such a bummer for the whole team of engineers. I, my heart goes out to everybody working on this thing because it honestly succeeded in every way, except for this fuel leak that they had right after it separated from the launch vehicle. And it's just because it was kind of erratically tumbling they had to use more fuel to get it to point at the sun to charge the batteries. I think it's just a reminder of how hard this is. You know, it's kind of a cliche, but space is hard. And I hear a lot of people saying things like, well, it's been 50 years. Like, why can't we just, it should be like no big deal. And I'm always like, yeah, the rockets are more advanced. Technology is better than it was during Apollo, but the physics hasn't changed. It's still far away. You have to get to insane speeds to get off Earth and then come to a complete stop to land safely. And I think Astrobotic encountered kind of a wild card in that this past week. It is hard, and, and that is what we hear. And there have been other missions that have failed recently, right? I'm thinking of Israel, uh, some other government agencies didn't make it there. And, and as you mentioned, it is hard. But what is riding on these payloads? Because Astrobiotic is just the first of many in this commercial program with NASA to put commercial payloads on the moon. How essential is this for NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration that these commercial payloads are successful in landing on a lunar surface? NASA has talked about this in terms of sort of fostering or seeding a new lunar economy. I think it's probably valid that if NASA plans to land people on the moon again, which they intend to do as of now, we'll see what happens after the election, I guess, it's not going to happen without a lot of help. It's not going to happen just with federal funding. NASA's hoping that if they sort of create this economy around access to the moon, they can just hitch a ride. They're going to be one of many customers, probably still the primary customer for a long time, but just a customer instead of the primary driver of the entire enterprise. And I think that's intended to make the whole thing more sustainable and longer lasting. And I think it might work that way if companies begin to succeed. I think Astrobotics challenges show that it's going to be a little harder than even NASA, I think, expects it to be. But yeah, it's, it's intended to make it last. It's intended to make it sustainable apart from any government changes, apart from any sort of fickle <laughs> the leaders in Washington, you know, making decisions. It, it sort of will be self-sustaining and it will continue no matter what happens. And we'll see. A lot of their payloads on there are for private customers, private companies, or even private space agencies, other companies, other countries' space agencies. 
And so if NASA is right, they'll just be one of many of those. And a lot of people want to be up there for a lot of different reasons. Let's talk about the human aspect of NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration. There was a delay in future Artemis missions. Uh, what do we know about this, Rebecca? Yeah, this was a, another decision that happened on the same week as the astrobotic issues, which was kind of a bummer for the moon, I guess. But it, was, it wasn't related to that at all, even though it felt related. The Artemis delay was because of issues with their lander, which is a SpaceX rocket, which is the Starship. And they've had a whole bunch of issues with that. And there's been some FAA issues. There's been some regulatory issues with this huge new rocket SpaceX is trying to get off the ground safely. And given those delays, that's the vehicle that's supposed to land humans again for the first time since Apollo 17. And it's not so far had a major success. And so NASA is pulling back a little bit on their timeline. And I think that's expected. You know, this was sort of a really accelerated timeline under the Trump administration. And almost nobody that I talked to believed that would happen on that timeline, landing by this year. And then after the Biden administration took over, that got pushed back a little bit. Then it got moved up again. Now it's gotten pushed back again. So it's kind of, it's never been like a firm deadline. And I think it's not really as disappointing as it feels, maybe, because everyone expected that. It's, it's you know, it's going to get pushed back again, probably. And as you mentioned, with a, an election on the horizon, it's not always rocket science, it's political science that can all change as well, too. So lots to look forward to when it comes to the Artemis program. You're listening to Are We There Yet? I'm Brendan Byrne. We're speaking with Rebecca Boyle, acclaimed journalist and author of Our Moon, How Earth's Celestial Companion Transformed the Planet, Guided Evolution, and Made Us Who We Are. All right, Rebecca, let's talk about the book. But first, I want to talk about your fascination with the moon. And where did the idea for this book come from? I've always been fascinated with the moon. I Ever since I was a kid, I think I think a lot of young people kind of have an affinity for the moon because it's in so many bedtime stories. When you're little, it looms so large. And I just never really lost that, I guess. I remember being in probably fifth grade and sitting on the floor of my library, listening to a recording of the Apollo 11 tapes and just being blown away. Like the idea that they were up there on that thing in another world just blew my mind and honestly still does. And so I kind of set out to write an appreciation of the moon just as somebody who like defends it. You know, I read about astronomy a lot and astrophysics and the moon is kind of annoying for most of those scientists. It's just so bright. It's in the way if you're studying, you know, black holes or exoplanets or gravitational lensing you need a dark sky. So you have to schedule observations when the moon is not up. So it's almost kind of a joke among professional astronomers that like, oh, the moon is just like so boring. It's just in the way, you know, and I'm always like, no, that's so interesting. It's so amazing. And we should really pay more attention to how important it is. And that's kind of how the book started. And then as I did my research, it sort of transformed into more of an argument. I think that the moon, this is not just an appreciation of this other world. It's an argument that it's central to our existence. It's been involved in everything that's ever happened here in a really fundamental way, from the evolution of life on land and in the oceans to the origins of human civilization and our culture, the way we develop religion and modern science, technology, all of these things derive from our relationship with the moon. And so the book is really an exploration of all of those ideas. I've been on a bit of a historical nonfiction kick lately and I've been reminded that, I mean, the moon played, as you mentioned, such a vital role in so many cultures and religions over human history. Is there anything that you found in, in researching this book that, that really stood out to you about the way humans perceive the moon and how it affected culture? I think the most surprising thing was how fundamental it was in shaping civilization itself. Like I sort of came at this thinking about timekeeping as an early idea of how humans use the moon. And it's obvious that across cultures across the planet that that's how people figured out how to mark time. I mean, the month, the word month comes from the moon. We divide up the year according to the lunar cycles. We don't use them necessarily the same way we used to because we have, now we have the Gregorian calendar, but every culture across time, across earth used the moon to figure out how to tell time and how to orient ourselves in time. I think humans are the only species that we know can do that. You know, animals, can plan, they can like squirrel away nuts and things like that. But it's not like we can say, oh, in four moons from now, I'm going to go take a vacation. And eight moons from now, it's going to be fall and I'm going to, I have my wedding or whatever, you know, ceremonies, anniversaries, events, markets, all these things that develop human society 
the way we mark time for those things and count toward them is because of the moon. And I think that may have been an obvious thing to think about when I wrote the book. But what I didn't expect was how transformative that relationship was in creating human civilization. Once you can mark time, once especially you can figure out how to correlate the solar year with the lunar year, because they're not quite the same length. There's about 12 days difference. 12 days of Christmas is actually a holdover from this tradition. There are 354 days in 12 lunar cycles, but 365 days in a solar year. So you have to figure out how to combine those things. Otherwise, your moon calendar is pretty far off within a year or two. So people who did that, who could figure out how to fix the moons against the solar year, had a lot of power. It was sort of the way that people controlled time. And anybody who controls time, who controls the calendar, can control an entire society. I was surprised the extent to which that really enabled people to seize power and to be able to develop civilization. This comes from the book's description, so I'm not giving too much away in case folks do pick up the book, but the moon is also responsible for the flow of blood in our bodies. Is, is that for real? Yeah, we think so. I mean, it's this is one of those things that's just difficult to prove in modern epidemiology. You know, like there's so many other pressures on us. There's artificial light at night. There's hormones in the water supply. There's so many other biological pressures in modern society that make it hard to tease out a litter signal. But we know that its gravity and its light have profound effects on things like the movements of the leaves of plants. And those, you know, cells are the same size and the same function as the cells in our bodies. I think it's probably very likely that the moon plays a fundamental role in our biology. And there are medical studies that show connections between things like aneurysm and stroke happening during full or new moon cycles. So when the moon is aligned with the sun and it has a stronger gravitational effect, there's a biological effect too. And this is, again, across cultures, across modern earth, this is happening. So I think we don't probably really fully understand right now the extent to which the moon still plays a role in our physical evolution. So, so the book chronicles this kind of physical and cultural and social fascination with the moon, but that fascination continues even today. We were just talking about the Artemis program, which, you know, despite these delays, our efforts to get people back on the moon is still captivating people. What do you think is still driving this, I hate to use the term, moon fever over all of these centuries? I come at this from just my personal point of view on the moon, which is that when I look at it, I feel like a sense of homesickness is probably the closest word I can think of to describe it. It's this feeling of longing, like it's right there, but it's so far away, but it's not. It's right next door. And kind of the the push and pull of those competing ideas just really compels me to think about it and to wonder about it. And I think I'm, I'm not alone in that feeling. You know, I think humans have always felt a deep connection to it. And it's there's something both otherworldly and yet so familiar about the moon. And I think it's just a natural place for us to project ourselves both physically and emotionally, spiritually. And I think it, it just is an extension of our drive to explore and to understand our environment. We've been speaking with Rebecca Boyle, acclaimed journalist, lunar defender, and author of Our Moon, How Earth's Celestial Companion Transformed the Planet, Guided Evolution, and Made Us Who We Are. Rebecca, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Still to come. So we're in the margin unit right now. It's the, the region that we're traversing before we actually leave the crater. And so what we're driving across right now looks like these rocks that have uh, had an influence from water flowing over them. Um, they look a little bit like the rocks maybe from outside the crater, something you would expect inside of a crater on Mars, but they have been heavily altered by water. So we have that really great evidence for water, which of course is one of the things that we look for when we talk about a habitable environment on Mars. Dispatches from the surface of Mars. That's ahead on Are We There Yet? You're listening to Are We There Yet? I'm Brendan Byrne. Our robotic explorers on Mars are back to work after a brief and planned pause in communication. NASA's Perseverance rover is exploring a region on Mars once thought to contain water in the search for signs of ancient life. Amy Williams is an astrobiologist at the University of Florida and scientist on NASA's robotic missions on Mars. She joins us once again for an update on these robotic Martian explorers. Amy, welcome back to the show. 
Thanks so much, Brendan. So the last time we spoke, all of the the little buggers on Mars were were taking a break due to the conjuncture. Are they back? Are they working again? Are you talking to them? Yes. Yes, we definitely are. Everybody is uh, back at work, both the people on Earth, the rovers on Mars. Yeah, we've been doing operations with both of our rovers. Kind of always feel like at the beginning of the year, we come back from holidays. And for me, the semester starts and it's just this whirlwind. So hopefully the rovers got more of a break than than we probably did with the holidays. And and do they do anything recreational uh, while they're on their break? <laughs> Are they playing bocce ball on the surface of Mars? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You know, so yeah, it's uh, beach weather. They, um, they, they, they think they do get a break. That's a good way to think of it because, you know, we're not commanding them to do really anything new. They have like their preset schedules, sort of like my robot vacuum, where it, they will take pictures. They'll do the things they need to do. This really cool thing came back from Curiosity, where we took these images every couple of hours of like a whole Martian day from, from sunrise to sunset. And it's just really cool to sort of see how the, you know, obviously as the sun moves through the sky, you see the rover's shadows um, shift and get longer. And it's just really cool to see that sort of like terrestrial perspective that we're also used to seeing, you know, the the shadows grow longer if you're sitting outside all day. And so it's really cool to see that happen on Mars. I, I want to talk about what's ahead uh, in the immediate future for Perseverance. But before we get to that, a, a little headline um, recently took my breath away, and it was that Perseverance lost communication with Ingenuity. And this is the the little helicopter the stowaway that has, has done such an incredible job while it's been on, on the surface. Perseverance has restored communication, but tell me a little bit about what we know happened in those kind of nerve wracking days for me. And, and, I, and I have no attachment to, to this project other than an observer. What, what happened? Yeah, so right, Ingenuity is supposed to fly five times. I think this was the 72nd flight. So uh, it's doing just fine as far as its ability, you know, to break records and fly in another world. But yeah, so, um, you know, all we really know right now, and I know I'm sure the engineers are working on it, we did a, a little flight and then lost communication for, oh, a day or so, something like that. But then but then we're able to establish communication with the helicopter again. These kinds of things, you know, happen sometimes for a variety of probably very stupid, not so important reasons. But for those of us who are just kind of watching, myself included, you know, it's always like a moment of like, oh, oh, no, you know, like, are we are we going to be able to recover? And of course, you know, in this instance, we were able to and we're talking with the helicopter again, but it's, it's hard to not get attached to these vehicles. And you always recognize they do have finite lifetimes. But yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I had I had sort of that like catch in my breath, like, uh oh, oh, what's going on now? So but yeah, we have communication and uh, hopefully we'll have future flights with Ingenuity. As you mentioned, there were only five planned. To my understanding, each of these flights is kind of pushing it, pushing the envelope a little bit farther and farther to see what you can do, because eventually you do want to have these tools to rovers on on future missions, right? I mean, this has got to be optimistic to see that, you know, these engineers are really pushing this thing to the limit and it still lives to fly another day, right? (laughs) Yep, absolutely. It is really reassuring. And and you're right, you know, we look at it for different future architectures for Mars, uh, for Titan. Um, There are all of these opportunities to use these aerial vehicles. And, you know, maybe we can even use them when we send humans to other worlds. So it's really cool to see us, you know, it is stressful to push these robots to their limits. But you're right that this is giving us so much information about how to build future vehicles. And Amy, remind us, is the science team actually using data from Ingenuity or is this, this is strictly kind of an engineering proof of concept at this point? So so sometimes um, there's like opportunistic imaging data that comes back that we can use to sort of use as a reference for places where we think we want to go and kind of what terrain we're getting ready to get into. Generally, just on the engineering side, you know, seeing what this, this helicopter can do. But yeah, there's no limit to the opportunistic opportunities that we get to, to use those images to help help guide where we might want to go. Um, we have a pretty set path right now with Perseverance, so it's less useful as far as, you know, do we do we zig or do we zag? We know which way we have to go, but it is useful to have eyes in the sky, what's coming up ahead of us. Let's talk about where Perseverance is 
after it has woken up from from that vacation, uh, as we as we spoke of earlier. Remind us of, of where Percy is and uh, what it's up to right now. So, um, you know, Perseverance has completed several campaigns so far in collecting the sample suite for hopefully eventual return to Earth with the, the samples. And so right now we are in what's called the margin unit. We decided if we call it the marginal unit, it kind of makes it sound a little diminutive. But no, this is like margin between all of the sedimentary rocks that we see inside the crater that were deposited by water. And once we leave the crater, we're going into this really ancient terrain. And so this is sort of like that last little step before we we go up onto the crater rim. So we're in what's called the margin unit. We've been uh, working to traverse this terrain. We knew it would be challenging. It has been a little bit difficult here and there just because of the way the terrain is laid out. But we are slowly navigating uh, to the west heading towards the crater rim. You're listening to Are We There Yet? I'm Brendan Byrne. We're speaking with Amy Williams, an astrobiologist at the University of Florida and scientists on NASA's robotic missions. Uh, we're talking about perseverance. It's moving its way west. Can you tell us a bit about the geology of, of this area that's so interesting to you, Amy? Yeah, so we're in the margin unit right now. It's the, the region that we're traversing before we actually leave the crater. And so what we're driving across right now looks like these rocks that have uh, had an influence from water flowing over them. Um, they look a little bit like the rocks maybe from outside the crater, something you would expect inside of a crater on Mars, but that have been heavily altered by water. So we have that really great evidence for water, which of course is one of the things that we look for when we talk about a habitable environment on Mars, a place where life would want to live if it had been there. So as we traverse the margin, you know, it's it's really interesting to see these new geography and geology, right? It's a different geology than we've seen in other parts of our traverse through Jezero Crater. And the geography is actually part of what makes traversing this area so challenging. There are these kind of low-lying paver rocks that you can drive across, and then there are sort of these high-relief rocks scattered around that you sort of have to dive and bob around to, to move through this terrain. And so that's been some of the challenge of just being able to see far enough ahead of us that we can tell the rover, okay, I want you to go to this place and dodge all of these rocks while you're at it. But this is definitely a new a new terrain and area relative to the other places that we have explored previously as we're sort of moving up both to the west and then up in um, elevation towards the rim of Jezero Crater. We have talked about water on Mars before. You've described what it may look like and all this stuff. But just in this moment here, when you just said rocks influenced by water, it hit me like <laughs> this is wild. Can you tell us a little bit about what this water may have been like when you say influenced by water? Are you meaning that? water rushed over these rocks and, and kind of changed the shape of them or, or move them. Tell us a bit about what we know about the water here or the, the former water here. Yeah, I think it's even more, and no, no offense to my hydrology friends, I think it's even more exciting than water just flowing on the surface like as a, a river. It is a long-term interaction of water with these rocks. So we're talking about there's the surface water of the river that was carrying the water into Jezero Crater but it's also the groundwater, that stuff that moves more slowly and percolates through these rocks, slowly changing their chemistry. Um, so this is where you can tell the rock kind of looked like what geologists call olivine or it's a basaltic rock. It has sort of that signature, but as water flows through it over geologic timescales, uh, you can change the chemistry, and that's what we're that's what we're observing, and that's what's so cool about you know these these missions in general is that you can reconstruct eons of history on another world just by looking at the chemicals in these rocks. So it's not the like the physical geography, right? When you when you say influenced by water, I'm thinking, you know, a rock is smoothed over by being at the bottom of a riverbed or something like that. You're saying the chemistry of these rocks is changed because of water. It's both of them. You're right. We do see rounded rocks as well. So it is both. So you're seeing sort of a a longer timeline of water messing around with these rocks, both in the ground, on the surface, moving boulders. Yeah, you're seeing a long-term process with water interacting with these rocks in Jezero Crater on Mars. I don't know why that hit differently, but that is just absolutely <laughs> incredible to think about, isn't it? This is why I love doing this every day. It's so easy to kind of be like, oh, you know, let's call into ops, let's do what we need to do today. 
Uh, here's our job. And I'm like, wow, this is our job. You know, we're reconstructing ancient Mars every single day. Oh, man, that is so cool. I picked the wrong line of work, Amy. Um, <laughs> no, no, you get to hear about all the amazing things that are happening, not just Mars. That's true. Let's 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 round out the conversation with those amazing things that are happening, because also another thing that that hit a little different to me when I was looking at, at some of the background for our conversation here is this month marks 20 years since Spirit and Opportunity landed on Mars. There's also curiosity. Amy, can you just reflect on these two decades of, of exploration in, and what we're learning about on the red planet and really what is ahead for 2024? And I know that's not gonna be a short answer, but what, what, what are you so excited about? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, you know, for many of us, my generation, you know, we watched the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit and Opportunity launch and land on Mars. And, and that really was sort of the start of the new generation of Mars exploration um, for scientists like myself. And so if you think about sort of the transition of looking for evidence of water, which Murr did, you know, in, in fantastic style, to looking for evidence of organic carbon, which Curiosity accomplished, uh, continues to accomplish, and now looking for evidence of ancient life in the rocks in Jezero Crater with Perseverance, you're seeing this beautiful evolution of our understanding of Mars, we now know better than ever where to look and what to look for to try to answer those really profound questions about Mars as a planet, as it evolved, why it's different from Earth, whether there could have been life on Mars as it arose on Earth, you know, in the same time frames. It's it, it really has influenced not only what we're doing, you know, like in terrestrial science and then in planetary science influences sort of our science fiction and where we think we can go as a species. I mean, you know, I can, I'll pontificate, you know, forever on why planetary science can be so informative and inspirational, but it, it really is. It gives us these opportunities to think beyond ourselves. And it inspires such fascination and curiosity. Thank you so much for sharing that with us each and every month as we continue to explore the red planet and beyond. We've been speaking with Amy Williams, an astrobiologist at the University of Florida and scientist on NASA's robotic missions. Amy, always a pleasure to have you here. Love coming on here and chatting with you. Thanks again. Well, that's gonna do it for this week's show. If you're not already, be sure to subscribe to the show's podcast feed so you never miss an episode. Do that on NPR One, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We've got more space coverage online. Visit WMFE.org slash space. Are We There Yet is a production of 90.7 WMFE News. Our producer is Marion Summerall. Editorial guidance from LaToya Dennis. Support for Are We There Yet comes from our listeners. Until next week, I'm Brendan Byrne. Thanks for listening. <laughs>